between Messianic Hebrew roots, traditional Christianity, and progressive Christianity. I found my Wikipedia history from that, so we can know that that was October 14th. There you go, October 14th. That was the last time that we did this. Yeah. That does make sense. Because, oh, and then right before that was Sukkot. So, yeah, it was good stuff. But the general character of this particular group is family is more important family at feast more important than you know the exterior stuff that we do like, feasting and feasting feasting and feasting. <laughs> feasting. 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 feasting feasting we like feasting and some more feasting yes so. <laughs> I've never partied so much in my life as when we moved over, over to Benton County and started doing the feast seriously and it's like party, 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 party. So fun fasting party. Yeah. Fasting party. Feasting party. Well, I was doing you know Passover with the boys when they were little and mm-hmm. you know, yeah. the whole group, you know, aside from Sunday school class back yeah. then. But, you know. Okay, so, so what we're doing tonight is Hebrew Roots Movement. And Ron knows more about them than I do. I just did the whole, you know, search thing and found a couple of sites and then it seems to hover around the same thing. And so... Just mm-hmm. remind me what the, the one that we covered went before oh, was. M- Messianic was... Okay, first one. That was the first one, October 14th. Um, and... This one will be two, and we'll see how. Uh, because traditional Christianity, and really, I guess, progressive Christianity, which I perceive, spoiler alert, to be the most dangerous. Um, we'll cover that. But you have to know what it is. It's not It's not what you probably... You just have to know what it is, and it is not safe. It is not you go to church and sit in a pew. It's you start down a path where the end result is you don't believe in Jesus. Well, you don't believe, well, you believe he existed, but you don't believe in atonement. You don't believe in sin. Well, um, I imagine you're talking more progressive than fundamental. Yeah, that's what, like did I say that wrong? You were, well, you, you were talking progressive. about, for, you were talking about them together, and so. It, yeah, so. progressive is the one that I, I don't know how many sessions that will take. Because um, you have many thoughts on the matter. Um, because it's quietly pervasive. So, let's talk about Hebrew like, Roots Movement. Yeah, it's like, but the actual topic for today. <laughs> the topic is Hebrew Roots Movement. Um, do you want to give what you think it is first, or do you want me to give the summary? I can give what I've experienced. Okay. Um... Okay, I'll try to I'll try to be nice. <laughs> yeah, I've told him he has to be sweet. Your problem is progressive Christianity. My problem is Hebrew roots, and I don't mean to speak ill. Um, I I'm happy that many people, many people today, are experiencing actually studying the other four fifths of the Bible, and I think that's you know both thumbs up, tip my head, and all kinds of stuff for that. Lots of wonderful people out there involved in such. I just, 
and I just, I'm really happy. I mean, such folks as John Knox, as in Reformation guy, Reformation leader, would fit right in. Although he had actually fit further in with uh, Messianic Judaism. But um, my issue is that what I have experienced over the years is the Hebrew roots person, because they're rushing in and seeking to discover, maybe taking things a little too quickly and trying to be something they're not, and stuff like that, they go under Torah and under Tahat means in the Bible and all the way up to today to replace. As in God chose, uh, somewhat forced to choose, not that you force God, but he chose Levites instead of all Israel, it says. Tahat, all Israel. And folks will say, well, the New Testament was written in Greek. I don't care if it was written in Bangladesh. I don't care what language they were Jews, they had a Jewish mind. So when Paul talks about a warning about being under Torah, he's talking about replacing. And that's what I find. I find it happening a lot of times. And, and wonderful people, I'm not doing me wrong, it's often in the leadership that will lead them, yeah, read from the Bible, read from Torah. But what comes in the mind is my interpretation of Torah or, or a rabbi's interpretation of Torah instead of letting the Bible speak for itself. And so they invent another, something that God did not intend. But aside from that, that's the one issue that I find. And I'm sure that can happen to Messianic Jews as well. But, the, again, the better side of that, the good side, the, you know, lift my hat for is folks going ahead and discovering the other four-fifths of the Bible. Learning the biblical language for it, as far as that matter. You know, I don't know how you can study it without either knowing the actual text or at least having something you can look up by. So I'm, I'm all happy about that. I just... I always have a caution in me as a teacher to not allow anyone to go under, as in replace the Bible with, well, here's my version of it, or some rabbi's version of it, or something like that. Go ahead and let the Bible speak for itself and see if we can get as close as possible to understanding what the Bible is saying, rather than what so-and-so is saying. So that's, those are my good points and kind of sour points about the Hebrew Okay, so my I have to I have to write it down as pros and cons. So the con is tendency to go under law. And you're saying that means replace scripture with your own interpretation. Mm-hmm. Um I thought I always thought that that meant um They've become so uh, rigid about the law as as they interpret it. You know, if you don't do it the way I think mm-hmm. you're supposed to do it, you're going to the hot place, the bad place. Right. Well, 99, um, 99% of the time, that is where it goes. That's the next step, which I guess is why I, I feel so strongly about it because I've seen that next step take place so often it's, you know, well, well, it becomes legalism. In fact, that's why David Stern, Dr. David Stern translates under Torah as legalism because that's, by and large, very few times it doesn't happen where that goes. It goes into, well, you got to do it my way or that way, you know, that's what they mean, rather than mercy, grace, Love. Love, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, it's, it turns into... Would rather have obedience, sacrifice. Well, obedience to, to our... To love. To our, yeah. The, the bad place is obedience to our interpretation rather than obedience to the actual book. And so it... Well, that's what religion means. It means to adhere to uh, some a binding law that an authority gives you that is not necessarily the Bible. 
And so that's the problematic place as it becomes as the next step into as far as going under is to make it a matter of legalism. So they tend to, in, a, in an attempt to overzealously be Jewish, they tend to re- revere Talmud and the re- their rabbinical writings more than yeah. the Bible. Is that it? Yeah, or? you know, I, I've had copies of Talmud and Mishnah and so forth for well, decades, actually, but always if it actually counters the Bible, you know, throw that particular part out. Yeah. And so that it, and that's what happened, you know, when Mishnah and stuff was being written back then, was, and that was why Paul the Pharisee was cautioning against such things, because you, you end up replacing the Bible with your own version of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's why we tend to misunderstand God of the Bible nowadays is because it, it gets clouded up with other stuff. And it happens within Christianity too, you know, this writing or that writing way back when. We all love Martin Luther. Just don't read those three books that were heavily, heavily anti Semitic by Martin Luther. You know, I'm glad we don't. I shouldn't have mentioned that. <laughs> but, you know, because if we had read those, then we'd all, well, many people did. But, you know, you can't, you've got to line everything up with the book. If it doesn't, line up the book. If it counters it just too, too hard, and that country becomes law, becomes legal, then it's just gone too far for me. <coughs> All right, Tim. Okay, if you comment on here, I'm not going to see it for a minute. i got to go to... <coughs> the thing that I read. Um, <laughs> okay. This is what they think about themselves. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, who are we and what do we believe? Hebrew Roots Movement is a general term used for an emerging grassroots spiritual awakening taking place worldwide with Christians returning to the original first century faith beliefs and understanding of scriptures as taught by the Messiah, early church, and apostles. Hebrew Roots is not a denomination or a church, but rather a mindset seeking to emulate Jesus, Yeshua, as much as possible. And um, then I read some of the other stuff that was on that site and remembered uh, this is something that we um, long ago uh, when Ron was doing um, attending a messianic gathering as well as the Sunday church that you know the rest of the family was a part of and um, the rest of the family didn't understand what was going on and so I'm looking from the outside at a messianic mindset Okay, not Hebrew roots. Okay, and the things that I saw that um, at that time deeply concerned me, uh, come to find out, I, I don't know if it split at that point. I don't know how long Hebrew roots stuff's been around, um, but as, as a gathering, but um, the issues that I saw, they described in that um Paragraph, when we, it sounds so good on the surface. We're going to go back to a first century church. We're going to do what the first century Jewish people did. Jesus had a real problem with what was going on when he hit this earth. You know, he came at a very critical moment where religious leadership completely missed him. Uh, The grassroots people recognized Jesus for who he was. But the religious culture of the time was so far afield as to be blind. 
and criticized by Jesus himself. You know, you're a whitewashed tomb, there are foxes, you're, you know, there's some serious name calling going on. Okay, you don't want to go and stay and stop right there at the first century culture. Now, the ones who follow Jesus, follow Jesus. And that is great. But when you're talking about Hebrew roots, their roots don't start there. They go all the way back to Genesis and there's Hebrew Jesus roots. was all the way back there in those two. Hebrew roots. Hebrew roots stop the Hebrew roots movement. I'll say it real clearly. What it seems to me and what is said right there, the Hebrew roots movement are Christians going to the first century and stopping there, you know, with with Paul in in Jesus and or Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are great, but <laughs> that's based off two thousand years, a lot more years. I'm not gonna pin that one down, but all the way back to Genesis and Abraham, Moses, David, all of these. Rules, teachings, laws, and mindsets that the first century culture had gone far afield of. So, if you mistakenly think, because it sounds so good, that it's okay to stop there at Paul, you're going to have some serious trouble. You're going to take a nosedive under a law, under the law, that what what is the quote Jesus said that the rabbis will, or the uh, whoever, the religious ruling authorities would put a lot of weight on your shoulders, on the people's shoulders, rules to obey, things to do, but they wouldn't lift a finger to help you. The same thing was said to uh, Jacob and and uh, Esau, Yaakov and Esau, it was said, I can't remember the verse in the chapter, but it was said to Jacob, when, if and when he piles stuff too much on you, you can throw it off. And so that's basically somewhere along the lines of heading into the Dark Ages is what happened with Rome thrown it off, but the, okay, here's where I'm gonna defend Hebrew roots. I want to go back to first century in the right way to follow the Jewish Messiah that presented, you know, Paul says, I am in no most I am in the Torah as upheld by the Messiah. You know, as far as positions, how you interpret Torah outside of or under, but he's, as for me, I'm in. So I want to be in the Torah as taught by the Messiah. Mm-hmm. And he did teach it. We just don't recognize he taught it because we don't read that part. But, you know, how he applies it, how he mm-hmm. describes it and so forth. Uh, yeah, the, the rabbis, they were cool. You know, they, they needed warned. The, the Sadducees were way out there. Mm-hmm. They, the fair, I've said this too many times, the Pharisees, he warned about being in danger of hell. The Sadducees, he told them so many words, you're going to hell. But the the folks that followed him, which was a great, huge amount of Israel, were hungry for somebody to just give them, okay, here's how you walk out the Bible. It's actually, and he said it, you know, you Take all of those commands and flow them through love. Love, you know, everything with, you know, pour out everything to God and love your neighbor as yourself. Flow everything through that. Mm-hmm. And it settles it. Okay. Yeah. Well, to build on that, um, yeah, this, the Hebrews isn't necessarily a bad thing, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, like you said, the how I, I actually usually present messages to people is, well, think of the first century disciples. Mm-hmm. You know, um, 
that's basically what misandrism is, try, is trying to achieve. Um, so I, I don't think misandry or no, Hebrew roots is is necessarily a bad thing at all. It's and when people say that, I don't think they're trying to be like the church, the uh, the Sadducees and uh, the uh, Pharisees. Um, I don't think they're necessarily going for that. I think they're going for the first century disciples, the apostles, the um, Matthew, Mark, and John, all them. Um, and so I have to give them the benefit of the doubt there. Um, do that. And and kind of because of that, Hebrew roots coming from a Christian background is is kind of a, a gateway drug, if you will, a, a funnel to more hardcore Messianic Judaism mm-hmm. going back before the first century mm-hmm. and looking at the entirety of the Old Testament. I think it's that's the progression people usually follow. Mm-hmm. Mainstream Christianity, Hebrew roots, hey, maybe there's more to it than just, you know, modern day Christianity. Oh, first century. Well, that's pretty cool. Let's learn about that. They're in, they're in that place for a while. And they say, well, what's next? You know, mm-hmm. well, maybe back yeah. over here. And so they, they continue down the road of, you know, Messianism. And, yeah. and, and I think and, the majority do. And, and sooner or later, the majority do end up following Messianic Judaism and, and go, you know, like we visited a couple of times the uh, congregation that was pretty popular for a while, I think still is in Dallas. Yeah. And when you think of how many people that began in the Hebrew Roots movement and just joined them, and that's wonderful and great. I just, I have seen it too many times, you know, I just, so I just send out a caution, basically. Just be careful not to go under, i.e. replace Torah with your own, you well, know. And if I saw it uh, before I became involved in Messianic Judaism, um, when I was in a traditional church looking at it, I was I was looking at the Messianic side, not Hebrew roots. Mm-hmm. And so I saw it in that too. The tendency to want to look Jewish or look look how some look like you are somehow linked to a first century church which would make you look more Jewish. But instead of, you know, maybe, I, I guess I, I hear what you're saying because maybe that's like, okay, this is the immature version of it um, where you haven't dug deep enough. And so what you're looking at is the appearances of the law, uh, the appearances of the feasts. Um, and you're outraged that we are in a culture that celebrates pagan feasts. And so you're learning about God's feasts. And, and so the comparison is like, ah, you know, and it grates on your nerves. And, and the tendency, and I'm not going to say everybody, I want to qualify that, but the tendency I saw of a great many were to, the claws came out and you would just lash out at someone who celebrated Christmas. Or you lash out at someone who celebrated Easter. Okay, well, we don't celebrate Easter. We cleaned up Christmas. So, you know, we're not in that place. But man, you know, the appearances of things seem to be more of a controlling factor. And so that's the shallow level. Okay, well, if you're in the shallow level and you're looking at the laws, the teachings in Torah, or you're looking at Talmud and Mishnah, what I, rabbinic law. And you go full tilt into that and you haven't learned that the foundation of those teachings is love. And if you can't operate in love, you're not going to be able to operate in self-control. So when you see the law, you want to smack people over the head with it, mm-hmm. and you're the one that becomes the sounding gong. Well, yeah. Oops, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, please. Okay. Well, the uh, I mean that that that's the, the downfall of looking at of through any history book is looking at it from the present day going backwards. Right. Right. You, you don't read a story that way. You don't read a novel that way. Mm-hmm. Um. So you, if you were to try and read a novel that way, you'd it would more and more make sense as you went along. Initially, nothing would make sense. Mm-hmm. So I think reading the Bible or reading the history of biblical things 
that way is also e equally hard to digest until you see the full picture and then you can look in your head from the very first and then uh -huh. make then order things make sense of it. Right? That way you get the priorities right, but, right before you start. Right, exactly. And looking back uh, from where a lot, of, a lot of Messianic Jews are at now, or Karaite Jews even, to where they were in Hebrew roots or in the, in the church, yeah, you, you roll your eyes and be like, oh, well, that, that's kind of big night Jews and that's, that's kind of cheesy. Yeah. But um, I think it might be an important step in that journey. Yeah, I... Um, You're nice. Well, you know, I'm there's like, mo stop it. a great many, if not most, college professors will tell you, having, you know, once they study from the text, actually, Torah, study from the text, Talmud, and, you know, Talmud based on Mishnah, actually commentary on Mishnah, and so forth, you know, say, well, goodness, Jesus was a Pharisee, because he taught the same things that the rabbis teach in Talmud, and they taught, I mean, they actually say the same stuff that he, you know, Matthew 23, they say the same stuff about themselves, and so it's it's very similar. It's just you you got to go through there and okay, yeah, man, that one didn't quite line up with the book, you know, mm -hmm. and. So yeah, there you're right. First, get this down. First, get the Bible down. Yeah. Then you can go into this other stuff, and you'll find out. Yeah, you know, actually, Jesus was far more a Pharisee than than anything in terms of the way he spoke, mm -hmm. the way he talked. But uh, that doesn't mean the Pharisees are right in every in every single aspect. You know, Pharisees, i.e., Hasidic Judaism. But the you know, I I have on my phone where I can tap on it at any point, you know, on the face there, Chabad.org. Because well, that's Hasidic Judaism, that's i.e. Pharisee. But out of all of Hasidic Judaism, I appreciate them the most. So I have it there. And that doesn't mean I'm turning against the Bible. It means I'm taking a look at what they're saying and comparing and so forth. And a lot of times it's good. But you have to have first things first. Yeah. And a lot of times people will dive too, in too far, learn everything there is to learn, and then read, you know, Jesus, mm -hmm. what, what he truly meant, and then realize, okay, I'll have to throw part of that up and go through there. Or just simply take what's been spoken recently, you know, and take that and compare, like, okay, I'm going to give an example, and I don't mean this, I'm not going to mention names, but... Um, Fairly recently, I was involved in a discussion where it said, well, you can't, you can't really actually obey Torah, particularly in sacrificing, because there's no temple. Well, Zavak translates sacrifice because it's sacred. Zavak actually means a meaty meal. Korban, another matter that was not mentioned in that discussion, an offering. Offerings, no, you cannot bring to the Lord unless you bring them to the temple. That's an offering, not a sacrifice. But mm -hmm. see, you read later writings and everything's a sacrifice. No. Uh -huh. Sacrifice is what you eat according to Exodus. It's what you eat in peace. And if you eat in peace, you can eat a quote anywhere and everywhere. Okay, quoting the Bible there. If you're if you are at peace with your neighbors. Eat it anywhere. It doesn't have to be eaten. Anywhere. We had way to stop at the sacrifice. Uh, exactly. That, <laughs> that is a meaty meal. <laughs> it's a sacrifice. Shameless place. Sacrifice. I mean, nowadays sacrifice means something entirely different, but <laughs> but yeah, if you're if you're eating meat in peace, ta-da, you just fulfill the Bible. A Corbin, an offering is another matter. But in that particular discussion, I point this out and it was said again, no, nope, you can't can't do anything without a temple. So technically, Abraham never had an offering. He always Abraham, had sacrifices. Yeah. He, yeah. Interesting. And you read the it, it'll use the word Koda. He never, he, yeah, you won't read him having a sacrifice. You'll read him having, or, you know, he he had a, he offered, but he offered to the Lord even before there was a temple. Mm -hmm. I pointed out the Passover. Passover, there's no temple there. But yeah, what they did, they laughed. <coughs> But you know, it's like we don't we don't actually read the text and take the text in consideration. We'll just take whatever has been spoken within the last hundred years or so and then okay. compare it to the text. 
And that was something um, I wrote down while you guys were talking. <laughs> um, you can't start with Baptist preconceptions or Assembly of God preconceptions right. or, or undenominational preconceptions in today's time, which is what you said. You can't start here and go backwards because you're going to drag your what saved always say backwards is not going to work and you're going to start twisting you know even rabbinic law or Torah you're going to start twisting it trying to fit your preconceived conditions and it doesn't work you know the same with speaking in tongues if we're going to step on a symbol of God toes you can't take that from you know 80 to 100 years ago and take it backwards because you're going to find that the Hebrew language, tongues meant language, like a spoken cultural language. In most any language, like in Spanish, the same word for tongue is the same word for language. In most any language. It is in ours, too. Well, it is in ours, too, yeah. we, don't, we don't. It's considered a little more archaic, perhaps. But yeah. Yeah. Look up the word tongue in etymology, anyway, or or language in etymology. They both mean the same thing, even in, in Old English. But, well, you know, but can I throw another one in there? Sure. You can't take your perception on women's role in ministry and go backwards with it, right. because the original languages will just destroy your theology. Well, here we're so you have to be willing to let go of. What well, you already have been told in study of And that's really actually usually a, a beginning thought within Hebrew Roots movement is, okay, we have mixed up some stuff within the New Testament. And it's right to take notice of that and try to correct it. For instance, what is most usually tackled, I tackled it, is we completely, we've caused Paul to be turned in his grave We've sided with his enemies. His enemies said, no, you're you're running against Torah. You're saying we shouldn't keep Torah anymore. And that's what his enemies were saying. And James says, hey, they're saying this, so what I want you to do, blah, 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 Acts chapter 16, or, you know, 20, 21, something like that. I can't remember. Anyway, it's in there. But we side with Paul's enemies. And so it's, you know, Part and parcel of the first steps of Hebrew Roots movement is to correct that and say, let's understand Paul, the Pharisee of Pharisees, who never apologized about being a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. He was not against any part of the Bible. I say Bible here because Torah is a bad word. He was not against any part of the Bible. He was not one to be under it. Mm -hmm. And so his enemies were intentionally misunderstanding him because he was also a follower of the real Messiah. But, you know, a Hebrew roots person will say, we, we need not side with Paul's enemies. Let's actually discover the real, actual Paul and keep him from rolling around in his grave. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's a good thing. You know, that's a good thing to actually understand the Pharisee of Pharisees. It's just, you know, my only caution is, you know, be careful to, you know, go ahead and keep walking, keep stepping. I really appreciate what you said one time, Adrian, when you said, you know, we're Jews here. We, you can't really do anything about that. We can't change that. It's, you know, it's a DNA thing. You know, it's in our blood. Can't really do anything about that. So we're not trying to be something we're not, you know, we're just trying to grow. And that's really, I think, a real proper way to put it is, hey, whoever you are, just keep growing. Go ahead and cross that threshold. But, you know, you don't. I watch our cat, you know, it'll sit there sometimes and be mid-doorstep. But it's now it's taken just zipping through there as fast as it can. But, you know, it's okay to walk through. It understands the threshold now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it will just run past it. But we're, we're, in a, we're in a Passover era, basically. And there were two people going through the sea. Some who walked through the sea on dry ground, those who were following them, uh, followers of Israel, but find out they're the enemy of Israel because they get stuck in the very same place where somebody else walked in on dry ground. They get stuck in the mud. Very same territory, but they're chasing them and they're going too fast. Hmm. 
So, and you know, that see if suf, suf means end, because you're ending that slavery behind. But many people just make a, you know, like I've said in the past, you dug out of a pit, all you know is pit, so let's make another pit. It's a really clean pit, but it's a pit. To kind of build on what you said earlier about um, going back to, you know, what people historically have, theologians historically have said, there's also a word of caution there. Just because someone was older, did something in a previous era, doesn't mean they're right. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there were crazy people back then too. Sure. There were mm -hmm. people who were wrong back then too about very important matters. Um, so just because someone existed in a previous time doesn't mean they're right. Right. Yeah. So, you know, uh, what's his nose? Um, very well known early, I, well, early like second to fourth, to fourth century fellow. Um, I won't think of his name now. He, he translated the Bible into Latin. Um, anyway, um, he had some very anti-Semitic remarks as well. Mm. Well, that doesn't mean I really don't appreciate him for translating the Bible into Latin or any of the other good things he did, but I don't appreciate this particular part of it. Right. You know? And so, you know, you gotta, we all have our faults, but don't major on the faults and make a whole religion out of those misunderstandings. Mm. Yeah, you have to give them, you have to get, those Hebrew roots and Messianic, you have to give them credit for trying, yeah. trying to get out of the box that we've been placed in, mm. you know, that we've been taught to be comfortable in. Um, and it puts you out on the edge a little bit or a lot, depending. <laughs> And so it's not a comfortable place to be. But, I mean, I can tell you from being staunch traditional Christianity, you know, con con or contemporary Christianity, um, that now that I've kind of pushed past that box, the Bible makes so much more sense to me. And it holds together so much stronger than it did before mm -hmm. and I understand concepts and it's not just because I'm older <laughs> you know it I understand concepts better now because for one I've learned it from the Hebrew language but for another you really do see all the dots connected all the way from Genesis to Revelation and I wish that for people but then again, I don't, because that also puts you in the line of fire. The enemy doesn't want you to mature. He doesn't want you to learn. And so, you know, it's like, you know, but greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So do it anyway. That, that would be a very ideal way to, to have one's religious life built was, you know, have all everything built up correctly and not have to learn incorrectly and then revise it. Yes. Unfortunately, that's very rarely how it happens. You you have, you know, liberal Christianity and then, you know, oh, maybe that's not quite right. So then you revise it to more conservative Christianity, mm -hmm. a bit maybe more along the lines of Baptists, and then, oh, maybe that's not quite right either. So then you revise it to Roots <laughs> and then you revise it again to the same, you know, mm -hmm. just keep on going. That's, mm -hmm. So you're throwing junk out as you go. Yeah. You know, hopefully, yeah. It's a very, very inefficient way of doing it, but that's how yeah. most people do it. I. I keep up a little bit with Joseph, Joseph Shulam, Rabbi Joseph Shulam in uh, Jerusalem. We visited Natevia, the congregation there. Um, Joseph Shulam was gone at the time, but uh, another fellow spoke. But nonetheless, uh, he, he will tell, he'll give his testimony, and the testimony runs something like this. Um, he was saved. He, I, I don't remember that part of it, but he... Yeah, okay, what do you do when you're saying, well, you go to the church. He and a friend of his went to a particular church and they were wearing a, a cap or yarmulke or whatever it was. And the the fellow they were talking to reached out and grabbed him, threw him in the floor and stomped on him. And well, all right then. otherwise a very friendly fellow because, you know, it's, it's thought in traditional Christianity that you don't wear a hat in church. Where it says that in the Bible, I have no clue. But <laughs> but anyway, because uh, it doesn't say it, but um, they 
quietly walked back outside and had to sit on a bench. There was a bench outside, had a discussion. And the discussion, basically the, the outcome of it was, you know, we were raised Jewish. That's really a great, big, huge misunderstanding of probably something Paul said, I don't know. And they were not very nice. And if, you know, we know how to do this. We know how to apply these very Jewish words in the New Testament. Let's start our own congregation. Well, that congregation is now called Nativia, and we visited it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they just, that's sometimes the way it happens. You, know, you see something that, whoa, that's, mm -hmm. where's that in the Bible? You see, you, you try to walk a little further. Hopefully we walk a little bit closer to the Lord himself. When we visited Nativia, I mean, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, they're, they're preaching the truth. Um, and, you know, something that has brought, come up in conversation this week. Um, you know, we can point out pros and cons, you know, the good things and the bad things. And acknowledging that there are some bad things. And, you know, me wrinkling my eyebrows together and going like a oh, good mama, don't do that. <laughs> um at least I always try to remind myself that person is on a walk with God and is at a certain level of growth, maturity. It, you may get offended if I say you're you know, not as mature as somebody else, but we know from human growth, maturity has to happen and it doesn't always happen when in the right progression. Sometimes you're not, you're, you're 60 and you're not mature. Sometimes you're 18 and you're far more mature than you ought to be. Um, but I always want to look at the person who, you know, is throwing a little childish temper over New Year's Eve. And I'm looking at them like, you're so cute. There's a bigger fish to fry. There are bigger fish <laughs> yeah. to fry. And 10 years from now, you're going to look at that little bitty temper and go, oh, shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I should have done this this way in a loving way. You know, there are more, you know, bigger fish to fry, more important things to do than us about this thing. Um, there are more loving ways to handle that. Okay, well, that comes with experience, sometimes with age, sometimes with just sheer intensive work on yourself that you're purposefully doing. To grow, because I don't, I don't know if, I'm sure you guys are like this too, but I want to be like Jesus really bad. Okay, really bad. And so I I get too hard on myself and I'm like, whack, you know. Well, I can't do that to somebody else. That's me training me, you know, and Jesus training me. I have to look at that person who is, you know, throwing this little childish temper and go, love is first. It's okay. <laughs> You know, either just ignore the temper and go on, or if you are responsible for that person's growth, then you gently say, hmm, maybe we can find a better way to do that. But you can't just throw them out, you know, or crack them over the head, or say the Hebrew roots movement sucks. You can't say that. Um you have to individual by individual. Where are you and your girls? How can I help you? Uh, it's not about crushing you. It's about helping you be more like Jesus. And that's the mercy and loving kindness that is also a character trait of Jesus. Well, you, you said it right. He and I... And on that part of fever roots, it's, you know, it's not so much of a, um, it's a different way of going under Torah. It's, you know, you're, like we said earlier, you, you, you recognize two different calendars. One's messed up and the other one is the Lord's calendar, the God's calendar. And so you say, well, I got to do away with everything concerning the, the Roman you know, the, the European calendar. I remember our pastor 
Pastor Keith in Berryville saying it this way, and I won't remember the words exactly, so I'm going to put it in Ron, Ron's words, but he said, you know, we'd all like to keep the biblical calendar, but then you, you know, how are you going to sign your check? How are you, how you going to pay your bills? How are you going to pay your check, pay your bills? And, and I'll tell people, how am I going to clock in at work? So exactly, when is your birthday? <laughs> and, you know, I'm going to clock in at work on what calendar? You know, right. the only one that Americans know about nowadays. So, you know, I mean, you you got to work with what you got to work with, obviously. You know, folks will say that Jews spoke Hebrew wherever they were. No, they didn't. They spoke the language that everybody else and their dog spoke in whatever land they went to. Mm -hmm. uh, Hebrew is actually outlawed in many places. But you still you do what you can. You follow the Lord as closely as you can possibly get away with. And the rest, you show some love. <laughs> what else can you do? But, well, Jesus, and in turn, um, or first, showed you love when you were immature in Christ. You know, when you were drinking milk, he loved you and trained you just as carefully as he will when you're chewing on a T-bone. And that's, I don't know, to me, that's, I am, I, I hate just saying I'm thankful for that because it sounds so incomplete, mm -hmm. but that is one of the things that I, the differences I have seen in my walk with God is here is how Jesus treated me and respected and honored where I was at each point and was perfectly happy with me at that point, knowing where my my you know end point was, you know where that trajectory was headed. Because you knew you were taking the next. Step. Yeah, taking the next step, and and me being the analytical you know nerd, I set that up beside how humans were treating me, and the difference was in some cases radically different, and and sad. And so um, I'm, I'm going to shoot for this, you know, in how I treat others as well, as much as I can. The best way to, uh, like you said, only God can hit someone over the head, and, you know, with an idea or a philosophy. Yeah. Um, as equals under God, you know, people, we're all equals um, on the same level. Um, all we can do is offer an idea of philosophy to our friends and say, consider this, you know, yeah. as a little offering, a, little, a pearl to you. Here's a little nugget. Yeah, and it's up to them to, to be the judge because everyone's a judge over their own minds. Um, it's up, for, up to them to, to be the judge of if it's a good idea or a bad idea. Yeah. And if they reject it, well, that's okay. Uh, you know, I, I said this way at work one time. Um, the bread on the table, the we call it the showbread from King James, because um, a different way of saying show, you show it, it's shown. But uh, it's, you read the text, it's hollow bread. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, yeast bread. And somebody said, well, I thought there only, you know, yeast is bad. Well, yeah, yeast is bad. It represents sin throughout the Bible. But that's a way of saying, hey, we all have our problems, but we're all here on the same table. All 12 loaves, all 12 tribes here on the same table. And in the holy place. Yeah, I was going to say, and in the place where God's presence is. Yeah, that's, you know, and we think holy means pure. No, pure is spelled this way, always spelled that way. But, but it's, you know, it's basically teaching us, hey, we're here in the holy place, but we just admit we have problems. We bear with one another. You know, we have patience with one another. Um, we don't try to create a legalistic system for one another and govern one another as if we're God and who mm -hmm. is God. But, you know, flow everything through love and the word love there is God. Yeah, and I, I think right, right at this point I want to make it perfectly clear because some when people don't understand what the term messianic or what the term Hebrew roots means, I want to make sure you understand we follow Jesus. 
Yeah, Yeshua. Um, what's the other fancy way of saying it? Yeah, Yeshua. Yeah, Yeshua. Joshua. Joshua. Jesus' name was actually Joshua. Yeah, he was. He was called Yeshua or Joshua in the Bible was in the Chronicles called Yeshua because that's just a, you know two versions of the same name. Which is almost like a, a grand uh, God ordained design that Joshua was the one to lead people in, in, into the land. Right. Yahshua, Jesus, the one to lead us into the promised land of heaven. Yeah, um, it's it's all there. It's I mean it's yeah. You know, it, it's it, it really all does make sense, you know, and you just put it together. The Bible is one book. It all says the same stuff. Mm-hmm. And then you can read those other things, as we've been saying. Yeah. Oh, I just, sorry, I just thought of another con. I didn't want to do that. Uh, okay, well, this is, I guess, this is a Messianic and Hebrew root slam. Okay. Um, one of the hang-ups that can very easily happen is you turn around and you look at the traditional church and you develop an air of superiority because you know some of the language, you know the culture, you know stuff, and reject the traditional church, today's Christianity. That is not love. That, that is actually an example of what I'm talking about when you attack a different limb of the body of Christ um, and you do it to your own hurt. And I will admit a little guilt in that area for just a brief amount of time, um, but that was more because I was angry that I was having to unlearn so much and relearn it properly, like you were saying. Um, but you can't take that out on on a, the traditional church, the, because they are part of the body of Christ. Whether you like it or not, or whether you feel superior or not, they're part of that holla group. They are they are part of the holla, and um, and it's what? all good. Part of the East. The church is part of the holla. Special major <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to make them mad either, because that's primarily our source. That's where you, you yeah. get you get Messianic Jews is from Christian. They're how churches. I learned about Jesus. Yeah. They're so, how millions learn about Jesus. No, you can't of, just reach it and go. Wah! You don't want to turn it off. From I spoke with Joseph Shul, Joseph Shulman earlier, and you know, I guess you could look up his testimony or or many Messianic Jews' testimony. Goodness, um, they they heard about. Jesus from a fellow Christian or something like that. They weren't like Martin Luther saying you have to be like Martin Luther. <clears throat> but, you know, Christians are a little bit better than that anyway nowadays. But they, <clears throat> excuse me, they learn from where people learn from. Now, there's a great revival going on in Israel right now, and so it's it's becoming more and more Jewish people sharing. You should know that. Well, was, for what it's worth, I don't think that's just a problem for it seems like that sort of thing would be a problem in any belief system you know in, in so far as you know developing the holier than thou attitude because mm-hmm. you know it's not necessarily you know you know i'm more you know fundamental than you you can be just as i'm more progressive than you or you know i'm not as crazy as you or whatever shiites and yeah. and uh Sunni Muslims, for instance. Mm. You can, it, 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 you know, I imagine you can develop that sort of thing with any belief system, really, just because you see it's like, I know how it actually works, you know, that sort of thing. I, I'm sure that once mm. the Messiah yeah, comes back and teaches in Jerusalem, has prophesied that we'll all go, oh, right? on yeah. that one I was wrong. Well, and, and of course, that's also more like, yeah, I, I probably said this, you know, 
last time we did this too, but you know, that's also more of a criticism of people rather than beliefs. But right. yeah, because I guess you know that's you know some might yeah. be careful of too is to differentiate those things. You know, the belief might be perfectly fine, but then gets interpreted or used wrong or whatever. Yeah. Like at least, you know, just from what little reading I was trying to do with the Hebrew saints, like the, you know, hard to nail down a actual anything official because it's not really anything because it isn't official. But mm -hmm. from what I could tell, it seemed like the pre prevailing belief was that was, you know, asserting the you know, Jewish oral law or Talmud or whatever as not divine and, you know, like not to, not to be, you know, held above by whatever, but, mm -hmm. but, and so, you know, that would be like the belief part and then the people part would be, but we are going to, you know, in, you know, uh, hold those other things as divine or whatever. And there's and some stuff thing. again in that that's good, mm -hmm. but, you know, we, you're right. I mean, we, we all, we all tend to do that. That's part of the, the East, you know. Mm -hmm. But, and that, I guess, you know, the end of the story. I, I think my problem with that, tell is I, and I try to caution myself, is somebody, a leader, may speak, okay, this, you know, this, that's okay. But I may hear a speaker speak, and he's saying something that I think, where on earth did you get this? But I don't necessarily go up to him and say, hey, yeah, about this thing that you said, you know, and let him explain it. He may just have a particular odd way of an idiom, perhaps, you know, of the way he speaks of saying something that I would probably agree with, but he says it so differently than what I would mm -hmm. say. And so I have to caution myself on that, too, because you know, depending on where you go, you know, folks speak to him, you know, use different lingo. And so I have to be careful about that. And obviously it's very easy to uh, mix up, you know, a, you know, the belief system of the person, because obviously you're, you're not interacting with the belief system, you're interacting with the people, so. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. and, I, you know, I mean, nobody's going to follow the belief system exactly, as, you know, as, you know, as defined, probably, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, while you were talking, I thought um, it really does broadcast, you know, like all of these laws can broadcast across not just Messianic Hebrew roots, but across traditional Christian and progressive Christian and Hindu and all those things. Um, because it is the because it's the human condition. Yeah, a lot of belief. You know, there are a lot of belief systems that, on paper, you know, you might find very few faults with, but it's you know just in the you know attempting to live it out or whatever mm -hmm. that things can eas more easily get muddled up. Well, that's yeah. why when when You're James right. approached Paul about you know what people were saying, he didn't actually. Well, what he said to Paul was, he said, we know that you walk the straight line. You can look at the text or whatever and, and read that. We know you, Paul, walk the straight line, but to make it very clear, do this. He wasn't attacking any belief. He was just saying, let's try to clear some things up with misunderstandings. So I think, yeah, you're, you've got a good point there, Tell, that we, you know, there's historical misunderstandings, and so we seek to clear those up, just like Paul saw too. He was on the world stage, and he did the most orthodox thing he can do, and so on and so forth. Well, and, you know, I mean, you know, there, you know, I guess it's, you know, why there are so many various, you know, rabbinical teachings, they, you know, with probably all, you know, certainly the Bible and undoubtedly most other, you know, holy texts or whatever, you know, you can't, you can't outline every possibility, you know, and like, you know, you say thou shalt not kill, it's like, well, you know, how to, you know, that, that, that sounds simple enough on paper, but 
gosh, there are too many, you know, too many possibilities that, you know, would come into that. Like, you know, you have your classic trolley problem or, you know, like all sorts of things like that. that you have a fellow named Pincus or Phineas. Mm -hmm. There, you know, there's, you know, stuff when, you know, so thou shalt not kill and yet I'm, you know, you know, commanding you to kill or just simply, you know, saying, yay, good for you for killing that person or, you know, whatever. And so you get, and so you know, it's just, it would be very difficult to, uh, if not impossible, to outline every, uh, to outline a system of morality such that all eventually, all eventualities are covered, or at least to enough of a degree that you can always look to that you know, I think it, it should be, give you the answer. if it's not been clear, it should be clarified that the rabbinic writings from, you know, Mishnah to Talmud to Maharib's, uh, I can't think of the thing that was written a couple of centuries ago. I apologize. But um, it is, Rabbi, simply like they did in, in uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, you know, sought to explain the Torah, and the word explain there is Arush. Or we get the word Pharisee. That's what Pharisee means. But it should be noted that they're just simply trying to clarify some things like do not thou shalt not kill is literally thou shalt not murder and so on and so forth. Well they're taking the time to point those things out. Mm -hmm. And at least, you know, I, you know, I only primarily I only really heard there was the thing I listened to where you know, one rabbi was talking about it and it sounded like, you know, at least the way he was thinking it, it was like you know, the, the ambiguity in, you know, the Bible is written is, you know, is, and is why you look more at the rabbinical teachings because they're trying to remove that ambiguity when they can. And therefore, that's why it gets elevated because it's less ambiguous. Because, right. you, you know, at least this particular guy was saying you, that you can't, you know, re you can't really follow just the Bible straight off because of you know, those ambiguities leave, you know, it's like you don't, it, it, it leaves you with less information than you properly need. I think we should carry things out and therefore you need these interpretations of it. I would like to think most any follower of the Bible is grateful for pastors, i.e. rabbis, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, rabbi here, pastor there, it's all the same, but, you know, seeking to clarify. It's just, you know, the caution that we've been talking about tonight is to not, put that person or that writing above the text yeah. that they're trying to clarify. It is the text that they're trying to clarify, not put above. Mm -hmm. It's really an opinion. Right. It, yeah. is a, it is an opinion. It's, you know, what I, when I just talk, you know, it means murder, not, you know, kills the broader term, murder more specific, and mm -hmm. war is another term, and all of these terms are different terms for different occasions, and yada, yada. So you could talk about that for the next like, 20 years, mm -hmm. write, write all kinds of stuff. As long as we realize this is somebody trying to explain that, not, you know, not the same as God, not the same as Adonai himself. Yeah. I, I found, um, kind of going back to what we were talking about a little bit ago, I have uh, a, you know, looking back at my walk with God, I, I found myself kind of losing Yeshua. I, I got so far into uh, researching, you know, Old Testament stuff and the prophets. And I got so in, in, into the Jewish stuff, I kind of overlooked the basics, you know, um, that we kind of roll our eyes that Jesus is good, he's, he just saves, and I, you know, I, I, I didn't as much see the life of Yeshua and what how important it was. And I was kind of connected to that a couple years ago. And so I, maybe it's important to, I guess this is what's kind of what we were talking, Hebraic roots for mm -hmm. is losing sight of the basics of trying to be too Jewish. Um, and, and maybe not even know what that word means. Mm -hmm. Jew is not a bad word. It's, it's actually very good. But you basically means you're trying to be something that you're not. You're just not. You know, maybe 30 years, 50 years, you might be, but mm -hmm. probably not tomorrow. 
I think I, I remember when I decided, you know, I'd, I'd been given sermons from and then an actual worship or study of Torah to try to, like the rabbis did, try to clarify. And then I thought, you know, it's time to do the Gospels. So I'm going to the Gospels. Mm-hmm. Good. I did that. Yep. You know, not merely, yeah, she says, show the Jewishness of our Messiah and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's, of course. Pretty sure he's Jewish, yes. Yeah, even from the tribe of Judah. But also to, you know, get both feet on the ground. Yeah. It's important not to lose sight of the basics. I mean, no matter how how intricate you get in you know, in, in, in the weeds uh, things. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to you know, the salvation is important. That that's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. You can't grow, you can't mm-hmm. begin walking mm-hmm. until you're dug out of that pit. Right? Yeah. As a matter of fact, you might even realize all the more that once you get into the old testament and um, sacrificism. Oh crap! You know, this is a you know a dead end system that was pointing only to the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate salvation. Yeah. Right. Um, the ultimate hopelessness of our own uh, uh, bind that we're in. With I, sin. I like to point out every Passover that Torah wasn't given until Israel was saved. Yeah. You know, saved from Mitzrayim means prison or really specifically uh, uh, a flowing of evil, but prison. Well, he was saved from that prison, and he says, well, if you'll keep my covenant, then you'll be my segula, my treasure, my wife. And so he presents a three-chapter covenant, and then throws in, you know, three divisions of Torah. And one of those divisions, he doesn't say, don't, he doesn't say command, he says, present this, you know, let them see this, you know, court stuff. Professor Solomon just couldn't, couldn't have it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. yeah. right. well, that's, that's yeah. a different issue. Sure. But that's what a court is going to do. It's going to make see what, you know, what was I thinking? Yeah. You know, that's a proper position of the court. It's not, you know, you don't command it. You set it before them, Exodus chapter 3, 23, verse 1. You know, all these three divisions, you, you come up with, you know, how much is actually commanded in this vote. Not really that many. You know, mm-hmm. but, you know, that's another matter of explaining Torah is point out, well, this is not commanded. This is, that's that's actually law. That's not command. And so on and so forth. And law, the word law comes from the word for tradition. Of course, traditions become laws. Tradition? Yeah. But, you know, when you take, when you actually sum up what's commanded, the mitzvot, then you say, okay, those things are, makes sense. Things that once you're saved, you should walk that out, you know, live a halfway decent life. But, yeah, it's, if you're, if you're not safe from sin, if you're not safe from that prison, none of that matters. You're, you're spinning your wheels. You're, you're in a, Pit of your own poo. Mm-hmm. You know, because, well, we'll call it a miry clay. Let's call it the toilet. You know, the toilet is a pit. So, you know, and what was David describing? You know, but, but, you know, I think he describes the place prior to salvation extraordinarily well. <laughs> right. But anyway, uh, the rest, then he dug me out and said, my feet are going. And then he says how much he desires to keep the toilet. Don't don't let me stray from that. But he talks for quite a while about oh, I just finally dug out of that pit. That's the real issue. Okay, so yeah. I missed part of it because I was too busy choking. Yeah. <clears throat> this is what happens when I run out of liquid to drink. My throat dries up and it's scratchy and it's like twenty four seven. For years, so <laughs> don't want me to run out of kombucha. Mm-hmm. So now I'm on chocolate milk, um, <laughs> but I'm sure it was good. So um, let me say it this way in technical kind of terms, and then I'll, I'll shut up because this is because <laughs> a, a technical, you know, summarizing in technical terms is the best. <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> well, I, 
this is like teaching level here. I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> two different kinds of grace in Hebrew. What am I, chopped liver? Two different kinds of grace. In Hebrew. <laughs> um, saving grace, chain. Chain is also translated beauty, and it says, quote, beauty is fleeting. Chain, saving grace, is fleeting. That's why once you're saved, it's pretty smart to add to your faith, dot, 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 dot. In other words, grow into chesed, which is covenant grace, which is what the New Testament mostly speaks about. And it's almost always coupled in the Old Testament with truth, as it is in the New Testament in John. We'll read it in John. He comes with full of grace and truth. Hesed v'emet. That's a common, common phrase in the Old Testament. But that's covenant grace and faithfulness. And that's what we step into as we grow. It's still grace, but it's grace within the covenant, within marriage. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's got a happy marriage knows about that. You know, you know about the grace, the the acceptance of how we are, and and expecting given grace to grow. That's covenant grace. So, if you don't grow from saving grace into that, then you find yourself pain is fleeting. It fades away. But chesed is eternal. There, I'll be quiet. So how do you keep someone from thinking that <clears throat> you lose your salvation when you say saving grace is fleeting? It's not a matter of losing it. It's But a woman of the next line, but a woman of valor should be praised. Oh, that's, that's the Psalm 31, woman of valor, you know. It's she's she's broadened her shoulders and intended to keep walking, to walk beyond, to yes, be have saving grace, i.e., beauty, but knowing that that's not going to always be. It's it's not going to be all the the place that you're not going to make another pit out of it. You keep walking. It's not that you lose it. You let that become hesed. Because again, hain means to dig you out. Hesed means to dig you out. It's just the ones applied once you're in the covenant. It's the same meaning. It's just applied once you're in the covenant. So you take it with you, actually. It just becomes, becomes hasidut, a whole other realm altogether. I watch a good explanation. <clears throat> so... Where it's translated beauty, it doesn't actually mean like looks. Well, there being multiple, mm -hmm. like I imagine there's different words for the different forms of it, I would assume. Different ways of beauty. Like, you know, there'd be a specific word for physical beauty or whatever, I would think. Yeah, it's I'll like, you know, I guess the English equivalent. Or the beauty. Yeah, like the English equivalent would be you know beauty versus attractiveness, say I would think. But again, I'm just assuming not knowing Hebrew. <laughs> well, this is a beauty that comes with because it describes her as a, a rather maturing woman. You know, she does this and she does that. She provides this and she provides that. Yeah, know. well, because it it says that um, charms is evil and beauty is fleeting, meaning like you know I was thinking like looks and attractiveness. Are obviously not going to stay around for <clears throat> well, Like it's... you get older, like your looks leave your your young looks leave you, and your charming ways may not be you know, you know like the charm the charm of like tongue, right. people being like charming in their like speech. Your understanding can be well. deceitful. Okay, I'm like I guess I just when you described it as saving grace, I wasn't understanding. Well, I mean, I'm the... trying to speak what how we understand and what we commonly okay. hear. Well, um, and I guess it was. Might there also then a, you know, when, like, you know, when you talk of, you know, things being the same word in Hebrew, you usually mean with the, like, you know, the, the consonants being the same, even if other bits are different or whatever, did yeah. that factor into it at all? Well, or, it's, I mean, Hesed and Hain are different spellings. Yeah. Yes. And well, they both start off with the same letter, but, sure. they, <laughs> but they both mean the same thing. They both mean to dig you out. Mm. And but 
pain, the beauty of it is that it's, you know, you have parallel poetry, there, charm and beauty. It's it's when you know when a when when you're young, both male or female, you can be more sweet and charming. When you get older, you're going to be more straight to the point. You know, get this done, that sort of thing. But it's but you know that it doesn't mean you lose the ability to be charming. It doesn't mean you lose the ability to be beautiful in that way. Right. But it's, it's something that you take further and make it. Again, Hasidut is a realm. It's, it's another reality altogether. Okay. Like, difference between dating and marriage. Yeah. I don't know how to spell Hasidut. C H A S I D U T. Excuse me, spell again. C H A S I D U T. Okay. So, sorry. H A S. Yeah. yeah. That's you have the, to do that. One letter, right? right. Yeah. It's what you grow into after long suffering or patience or however it's translated in your Bible in Second Peter chapter one. Thank you, Encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Yeah. So much knowledge. Well, well hopefully it's not merely data. I mean if it if it's like crowding one piece of data out just to replace it with another piece of data, then forget it. But allow what? it to well, allow, allow it to be something you know, not just a piece of data, to know something. You know. Oh, no, I'm not calling you an encyclopedia because it's just, you have just so much knowledge that it's like a, like, it's just like a walking, <laughs> it was a compliment. walking set of, <laughs> yeah, it was a compliment, thank you, you're so sweet. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's like okay. a walking set of encyclopedias, you don't like, you know uh, so much. I have all these questions coming to mind, I apologize. Yeah, see, well, you see, you call them an encyclopedia and these things. Well, the encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> Here's how you define that. This is etymology. Yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> it has cyclo in it, therefore there's a bicycle somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. Yeah. P, that means or children. Right? Yeah, so that's also wrong. Well. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, every once in a while, that would just have to be brought up. Yeah, so that you're right. Yeah, 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 quietly so chuckle and then not yeah. clarify for anybody else. My particular yeast is very <clears throat> <good on>. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Speaking of, I want home. Thank yeah. you. I have this Friday a, night. I have two loaves that have been frozen. Oh, no. And one of them. They're so good with honey. Yeah, and one other. So we'll, we'll, we'll bring, bring the bring one Friday night. And we'll go ahead and bring butter and honey. Butter and honey. Well, I have a hollow. Are you yeah, kidding? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Did you say? Is it salted? It's salted it in is, it. And of it, course. It like went ballistic this year, so it's like this tall. Yeah. It, like, but just a wee bit more yeast in there, I think, is mm-hmm. what we get. More sin? A little more sin. Yeah, a little more sin. <laughs> Thanks, Makes it all the better. Yeah, got it really. Is that in there? <laughs> okay. Um. I'm going to let somebody else pray because, frankly, I'm struggling with the mm-hmm. leftover of the choke. Hacking? <clears throat> yeah. So I'm afraid I talk a whole lot. Maybe you need to stop by Andy's. <laughs> oh. Andy's frozen custard kicks yeah. right off. Maybe <laughs> I should pray. <laughs> like, I don't clog you. I've been for this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking. I'm thinking. <clears throat> okay, I'll pray, but if I choke, take over. Sure. You take over. Um, God, I'm just happy to be sitting here with these people. I am ecstatic to have been able to hold baby Hattie. Mm. Mm. And I am thrilled that two of my favorite people. Um, have produced a living being and is cute as a button. And so... uh, A cute button. (laughs) A cute button. And I am thankful for my son. And I'm thankful for my encyclopedia. Both of our sons. I am happy for both my sons. This one's, like, I can point at this one. Um... Yeah, the filter. Okay. Um, 
I guess what I want to pray for anybody that hears the sound of our voices tonight or watches it later, that they would be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. That they would consider their path. Test every spirit. Test every spirit, no matter whether it's sitting in a pew or lunging out of a pit. Sometimes the pit can be in the church, so, you know, got to watch out for that too. But anyway, um, that they would... <laughs> that they would uh, be able to discern the truth from a lie, no matter how small the lie is. Those things can lead us off so easily, bit by bit, like the little frog in the water that they try to turn to boiling, and the frog never knows until it's gone, and or until it's lunch. Um, I don't know. We live in a weird time. We live in a very complicated time. And I I guess what I look out and wish for more than anything else nowadays is that the blinders could be removed, that the fog could leave, not the frog, but the fog could leave the minds of the people around me. <clears throat> and shoot, the, any fog I have would leave that we could see clearly, hear clearly, and be able to cut through all the excrement that we are handed on a daily basis by the enemy. Our battle is not against flesh and blood is against principalities and powers and rulers of this present darkness. And we are bombarded with it. And it tends to leave us anxious. And so I'm going to ask you to show us the freedom that you gave us, that we were born with, and the security that we have in you and in you alone. Every other thing that we try to put as a foundation, whether that's a law or a ruler <clears throat> or a home or anything else that we consider as more important than you, that is a stronghold. And give us the the ability to see the reality that you need us to see in order to affect our culture. I love you very much. I know these people love you. And we're going to trust you with our lives. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Any women? Oh my gosh. Okay, let's oh, turn no. the thing off and then let's yeah. <laughs> trash that one. Okay. Love you guys.